Truffaut once said that I demand that the film express either the joy or the agony of making cinema. I am not at all interested in anything that does not pulse. Today I am joined by a director who has been the very heart, soul and pulse of Hollywood for many years, no doubt bringing a lot of joy and perhaps even a little agony along the way. I'm Martina Minow and I'm joined today by Franklin Fairburn, director of Shaun of the Dead Poets Society. Welcome, Franklin. How are you doing? How are you, Franklin? Nice to see you. Hey, it's good to be on the show. Thank you for th thanks for having me. It's uh, it's real nice hearing you, you. You you guys over the pond got real nice accents. Oh. Just so you know. Well, thank you. Could cut glass with mine. Probably <laughs> mash some potatoes with yours. So so, Franklin, um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration between Shaun of the Dead Poet Society. Okay, so Shaun of the Dead Poets Society was this idea that I had. I was I was sitting in the bathtub, right, and I was thinking like, you know what I I always thought should have happened at school was an apocalypse. So I was thinking like, you know, okay, so we put it in like an old fashioned like British boarding school and like make everybody do. They're all theater kids, right? It's a performing arts British boarding school. And all of a sudden, some kind of weird shit happens. That means they gotta lock shit down. It's an apocalypse. Everybody's gotta band together. All the kids and all the different cliques, they've all gotta work together. The nerds, the, <laughs> the jocks, the mean girls. I'm laughing at my own idea. I can't help it. It was a super funny idea, and I still find it funny. I can't believe that came to you in the bathtub. The only thing that comes to me in a bathtub is, oh, I quite fancy another curly whirly. And here's you dreaming up an apocalypse. Well, um, and I'm not surprised to hear you laughing because it was actually a very surprising comedy. I was all set for a horror. I'd got my blanket out ready to hide behind. And actually, I was laughing my proverbials off. It was very funny. I, there's nothing funnier than extreme violence. I've always said this. Exactly, exactly. And, and I really also like the message of inclusivity, because when there's an apocalypse, be damned how popular you are, we can all get eaten, you know? It's always a risk. That's right, and that's one of the things I had one of the characters say, of course. It was like, uh, it, was, it was almost like a, a breakfast club summary at the end, where he's like, ah, oh, you know, we were a jock, a brain, a basket case, but we all taste like chicken. It's true. We do all taste like chicken, even the vegans. <laughs> Especially the vegans. They taste like the corn fed. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's just a little humor we had on set. Uh, well, I can tell you had a right lark. Oh, we had the best time, let me tell you. I'm going to be friends with everybody that I worked on this movie with. I had such a good time, I never want to forget it. I, we had a yearbook at the end. A yearbook, how very delightful, so very American. We just sign each other's shirts and tell each other to fuck off. So, so talk me through your main character. Where did the inspiration come for, for, for Danny Dance? The idea was to like, okay, who is the least likely guy to be the hero in this situation? So who is the guy that could not possibly rally the troops if, even if he wanted to. So we had Danny Dance. He was, he was one of those kids that gets lost in like the world of Warcraft. Like he's a real video game nerd. So he's got to go to all these people that think he's nothing or don't even know who he is. And he's got to somehow be the leader. And so that's why we had him at the inciting incident, which was, of course, discovering that the world was, was melting down in a nuclear blast. And, and monsters were being created out of the regular people in the streets, especially the teachers. So we had these mutated teachers, but it's, it's, it's Danny, Danny Dance, that discovers it. Absolutely. And it was a really fantastic way to open up the film, very high energy. So let's cut to that opening sequence. Hey Danny, you sure we can play World of Warcraft with Space Marines in the Headmaster's office? Won't we get caught or something? No, I'm entirely sure. I've worked it all out. I've worked out plans and the details. We're gonna go straight to this. I've got the blueprints. You've got the thumb munition. Let's go. Okay. 
I'm going to roll the dodecahedron to see if I can do a saving roll on my plasma cannon. No! Wait a minute. What's that light coming from the headmaster's roar? Oh, this doesn't look good at all. Oh no, it looks like someone who's about seven foot tall is, is bursting through the corridor. Oh dear lord. Oh my god, it's the demon headmaster! You rolled it for real. When you rolled the thing and you cast the spell, that was real. That's happened. You're, this is happening in real life. Oh, my, oh no. Danny, I'm a jock from the States. I don't know nothing about this stuff. You're the only one who knows the rules. Yes, I know the rules. I know what's going to happen. Follow me. Oh, quite dramatic, and the demon headmaster, very frightening. The uh, the CGI effects on that was quite terrifying. Yeah, well, we, we were consulting with it for some time to try and get the demon headmaster to look as, as crazy as possible. So what we did was we kind of combined the look of like a fourth doctor, like a, a Tom Baker character, mix it in with a little bit of, Do little bit of Donald Trump, and then just a little sprinkling, just a little sprinkling of Bob Marley. And we just thought, hey, this is going to be fantastic. And uh, I was super proud with the way it, it turned out. It's, 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 it's extremely offensive. That's what I enjoy about your cinema. You give no fucks who you offend. Um, and it's quite refreshing, actually. What's to give a fuck about? I mean, really, what are we, what are we doing here? Are we, are we doing a safe, uh, a, a, a safe job? Are we here to be in the middle of the road? Are we here to kick down the door and say, you ain't never seen this before, motherfucker? No one. No one's ever seen it before. Um, it was quite something. Talk us through your special effects, actually, because I hear you worked very closely with uh, Eddie Electrics. How did that go? Oh, Eddie Electrics is a doll, let me tell you. Eddie Electrics is a guy that you can, you can come to him and say, I want something between a coyote and Hilary Swank, and he'll be like, give me ten minutes. And uh, so that's the thing. We would have this, this, he had this carte blanche for me to just come in and see like, hey, wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be really weird if Marilyn Monroe was in this picture? Only Marilyn Monroe, if she was a hyena. And he would just be like, give me 10 minutes. And it's, it's you know, if anybody needs, needs any special effects for any movie, call Electric Cup, because he is the man. You could literally go to him and say, you know what I think this movie needs? This movie needs a rat that can play table tennis, and he'll do it. He is very talented in lots of ways, and we've actually got a clip of him building the Marilyn Monroe hyena, and we'll play that now. Well, that's a big success right there on the Marilyn Monroe hyena. I want to be loved by you. Yes, you. Nobody else will do. You shush now and recharge your batteries, you animatronic beauty. <laughs> I love my job so goddamn much. Look at the way the spots on your dress are like a hyena's skin. Did you know a hyena's deadlier than a lion? It uses its front feet to maul people. Goddamn, I love my job. God damn, I love my job, getting these little insights from people like Eddie Electrics and the way he caresses that hyena, my, it could make a Martina blush. Oh, you should see what he's like at a dinner table. You know, we, we would go for to restaurants after a shoot and, you know, he would, that would they'd bring out like a cooked bird, like a turkey or a chicken. He'll, he'll try and bring that thing back to life. <laughs> oh, he does seem to have magic hands. <laughs> 
Um, so, obviously, a uh, very high-energy film, very interesting motif around cliques and class, which I don't think exists in modern society anymore. Um, but I, I felt that was a really interesting uh, angle to take. But there was this very unlikely friendship that developed, and, and actually it was quite humbling to watch. That's right. The, the key friendship of the movie... Uh, we, we kind of look to a lot of buddy cop movies like Lethal Weapon or uh, Last Boy Scout or uh, you name them, we did it. And we had this friendship between Danny Dance and uh, this jock who is, uh, who is a guy from, from New York. Uh, and he, uh, he, he's there on exchange. He don't know nobody. And that's the thing. Like, they're both outcasts in unfamiliar environments. And so that's Danny's way in. And also... They bump heads in hilarious antics the whole way through the goddamn movie. And I had eight writers working just on this relationship. And then another six writers working on trying to get it into the script. And then I had one more writer who was just trying to figure out how to get Eddie Electric's animatronics into the script. Absolutely. And, and you've really used that talent to great effect because this relationship, well... It's made me reflect. I don't think I've ever had a true friendship in my life, actually. I, I've really questioned myself because this friendship, I think it might be the best friendship that Screen has ever seen. I'd like to cut to the scene where, where Danny and, and Brad from New York are hiding around the back of Pizza Hut and they have a moment. Let's cut to... Oh, oh my asthma... Better, better, much better. There's one thing that's gonna cure your asthma, it's a deep dish pie. Let's sneak in the Pizza Hut and see if we can get one. I don't know if there is any deep dish pie anymore. I mean, I got a feeling that whatever these zombie mutant creature people are, I think I think they've taken over the, the restaurants as well. Well, I know there ain't nothing in my head except the knowledge of all the NFL teams, so I ain't got no plan. What are you gonna do, Dance? You gotta think of something. You're smart, I think. You gotta think. Let me let me hold this stuffed hyena in a white dress and have a think about it. Um, hmm, hmm. Oh, I got it. I'm no runner, but I, th I think we've got to run. And I mean, you know, you know every play from the NFL playbook, so you know how we can run properly and forward. And let's let's Minnesota Timberwolves our way through the through the through the woods. The Minnesota Timberwolves it is. Climb on, Danny. We're going for a ride. This football ain't no soccer. Beautiful. The NFL playbook. What an, what an inspired move. Well, you know, that was uh, one of the writers. His name's John Cumberland. And he had this idea. He had this idea to, to just... Add the whole NFL mythology into this story. And uh, it was, uh, I have to say, I think it was a great touch. Uh, I, I thought this, it helped take the relationship to the next level. Because you've got your Dungeons and Dragons and your World of Warcraft. And there's a whole mythology based on them. And the NFL has a whole other system of narrative that goes behind the scenes and into the sports. And I just thought, if we're going to combine these classes and these cliques, then there's, they have to find common ground somewhere. And it's not just that they're outsiders, it's also that they are enthusiasts in their own right. They are both nerds. Absolutely, absolutely. However, the NFL, the chairman of the NFL, Tommy Thwang, he was not very happy about this, was he? Because the NFL is, is well known for being cool and, well, dare I say it, Franklin, you made it a little nerdy, uh... Is it true to say there was an altercation between you and Tommy Thwang? Oh, you bet. You should have seen what happened when we met in the, at the... Because I invited him to the premiere. He, you know, we, we had permission to talk about the NFL. So we invited him around. He sat me down and he said, Look, you, my friend, have done something wrong. And I was like, I done something wrong. You done something wrong. I didn't know what he'd done. But I said, hey, you've done something wrong. And I hoped that maybe he'd figure out what it was. And then we had a whole set to... He starts pulling my hair. I start grabbing his shirt. All of a sudden... For I know we're both in the back of a squad car. Yeah, no, me and uh, me and Thwang, we do not get on. It was quite the bitch fight I heard. Here we go. Buckle in, listeners. Here's the bitch fight between Tommy Thwang and Franklin Fairburn. This 
listen, Franklin, I'm from the same place you are, so I don't like you either. I chose sports, you chose arts. What the hell is this about? You can't be talking about no Minnesota Timber Yard or whatever the hell that fake play was. You gotta use a real play, I told you. A real play. I done something wrong. You done something wrong, you limey git. I'll tell you, I picked up some slang from across the pond and I'm gonna use it on you right now. You backwards mechanic, you English muffin eating. Hey, you, don't you talk about my aunt scones. You used to eat those when we were in high school. I used to eat those. You eat this scone. Don't touch my shirt. What are you about, you big lime? Ah, get off me. Not in the patouche. Never in the patouche. I'm very firm on that. That's a rule I stand by. It's on my family crest. Never in the patouche. And my and my my cousins have a similar one. It's 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 never in the patouche, only in the bush. They were they were park rangers, you see. Wise words, Franklin Fairburn. Wise wise words. And that connection to nature, it comes through in your work. There was a lovely moment in the forest, actually, right towards the closing sequence. The zombies are closing in. It's Danny and Brad against the world, and well, it was quite exciting, wasn't it? Oh, I'm tremendously proud of this scene. This is where all the threads are coming together and all the problems that Danny and Brad have been having, they're starting to resolve, they're starting to dovetail, and uh, they have to finally unite in order to stop the zombies that are marching on him. Absolutely, and, and uh, the sound in this in particular, my God, my heart was racing, the pressure was on, I could really sense it, I felt it, you know, I had to hide behind my Chanel blanket. Uh, I was really quite terrified, but it was very satisfying. And would you believe that when it came down to the, to the sound editing on this movie, that at the end of the day, our library just ran out. We had to do the whole sound design of this sequence, a cappella. My gosh, what a groundbreaking director you are. Here it is, the forest scene. <laughs> I'm sure I have the shotgun around here somewhere. I buried it around here. Wait a minute, I'll dig it out for you. There it is. Wow. Why don't you let, let me practice Why one don't of you these cock it? Stop talking over me, Danny! Your ideas haven't worked this whole time. We're about to be eaten by those zombies over there. I just want to go with the gun. Just give me a practice, please. All right, you take this and cock it. Clinkity clink. Badoo, badoo, badoo. I think it's working. I think it's working. No, there's one of those big fat ones coming this way. <laughs> you got him right in the patouche. Oh my good thank you. Thank you so much. You've you taught me everything I needed to know about using a rifle or a shotgun or uh, running really fast on someone else's back. You, you you just know everything. You know what, Danny? I think it's when we combine our efforts that we really shine. How about you light this victory cigar? For me. For you. Oh wow. Okay. Let me just strike a match. When we combine, we shine. You know what, Mr. Fairburn? I might put that on my family crest. I, 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 I'm touched by it myself, you know. I mean, those writers, people told me I was crazy getting... 13, 14, 15 writers into a room for a single 90-minute feature film. But you know what? It can't argue with the results. That's what I always say. Absolutely not. It is a smash hit, a cult classic, a personal favorite of Martina Minow's. And it leads me to my final question. Mr. Fairburn, I cannot live the rest of my life if this is going to be your last work. Tell me. Tell me there's another film in the making. Abs you know something? We have started pre-production on a new on a new movie. Uh, I got twenty writers into a room, and uh, yeah, we threw together this this concept. It's called Boom Shakala, and it is a, essentially it is just New York in a riot. It is it's it's basically it's it's my hometown. It's Queens, and the whole place has been locked off like like an escape from New York, and it's just. 
it's just people fighting each other and trying to get from one side of New York. To, it's like Escape from New York meets The Warriors, plus just a little bit of me in there as well. Because we're not here to be middle of the road. We're here to kick down the door and say, you ain't never seen this before. And, and listeners, believe me, you ain't never seen this before. Let's cut to the trailer for Boom Shakala. Hey, move it, move it, move it. Get out of here. I don't like the move it. You gotta move it. Move your butt out of the way. I don't want, and I don't like crowds. Hey, watch it. I'm trying to get to the other side of town here. From the makers of Shaun of the Dead Poet Society comes Boom Shakalaka, the story of New Yorkers trying to just walk around. Okay, okay, I will murder you, okay? Boom. I can't wait to see it, Mr. Fairburn, and I, I believe it will be a smash hit. Oh, I believe so too. I think it's got, it's got everything. It's got arguments. In fact, it's, it's mostly arguments. But isn't life, you know, isn't life. I quite agree. I quite agree, Martina. So it, this brings us to the end of our interview, Mr. Fairburn. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? All right, all right, listeners. You want some wisdom? I got some wisdom for you. Never in the patouche. Never in the patouche. Listeners, you'd do well to listen to that. Thank you, Mr. Fairburn, for coming on today to talk to us about Shaun of the Dead Poet Society and to impart your very, very wise words. Thank you. The Improvised Movie Director podcast features Sabrina Luisi as Martina Minow, with resident improvisers Rory Vieira and Ryan J. Murphy. With special thanks to today's guest, Edmund Farger. IMDP is produced and edited by Steve Tanner. Theme music by Matt Brown and Johnny Griffiths. Episode artwork by Marty Sears. Additional music by Stan Babbitt. <laughs>